This conference will now be recorded. Welcome to Oceanside Library's Garden to Table program with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'd now like to introduce Nicole and Beth for our program tonight, the Three Sisters Garden. Thank you. Okay, well, I am gonna start this off. I'm Beth and Nicole will be talking about the nutrition aspect of the Three Sisters Garden while I'll be talking about the gardening aspect of it. Um, a lot of us have heard of the Three Sisters Garden. This is one of my favorite subjects in gardening because there are so many layers to it, but I will try to restrain myself. Uh, Nicole knows that's hard for me to do. So let's talk about what it is. What is the Three Sisters Garden? Many of us think vaguely, okay, something with Native Americans, corn, something. Um, and you're right, that is pretty much what the Three Sisters Garden is. It is a traditional Native American garden, and it wasn't just planted by one tribe or one nation. It was planted by many in many different forms throughout North America. These three annual crops, corn, beans, and squash, all originated essentially in Central America, and this combination of the three crops were grown together in different ways, varying by uh, the the tribe that planted them. Um, but it was these were really staple foods and frequently this garden itself and the foods that came from it were very central to the culture. Um, the garden is almost always described by a story and this story expresses the idea of the garden as an inseparable union, sisters. Now Native Americans knew these plants were not related to each other. They bred them, they grew them for thousands of years. They knew they weren't actually related plants, but the reason they saw them as sisters was the beautiful way that these plants grew together. They felt that they ought to be planted together, um, that it was a loving and beautiful relationship of these plants that worked really well. Um, most of these legends also highlight the fact that the nourishment that comes from this garden is a gift, a gift to mankind. And for many Native American cultures, gardening is not just about growing food. It is about participating in the circle of life, being part of the activity of creation, if you will, being a participating member, not just an onlooker or a taker, um, but being part of the natural world. So this garden, for us in our backyards, it's really kind of about exploring growing these crops together and how botanically it works really well. But what you have to understand is that in Native American culture, it represents a great deal more than that. Um, so just going back to the botanical, uh, why plant these three crops together? Well, there are a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, you've probably heard of companion planting. That is when you plant particular crops together, and they not only fit well together, they actually benefit each other. This was an efficient use of space because these three plants had different growth patterns. They sort of um, occupied the space in different ways that allowed more to be produced in the same area. Uh, these three crops also made a really pretty good complete diet for the winter. This is something that Nicole can go into a lot more than I will. Um, and these uh, these crops were about food security. So you had something to eat over the winter. This was not a summertime bounty garden. You know, we think of gardening, oh, tomatoes and peppers and, you know, zucchini in the summer. This was not about that. This was about the fall harvest and the plenty that would carry you through the winter. And because these plants were not related, um, if you lost one, you still had two more to go on and you wouldn't starve to death. So plants benefiting other plants, they can do that in a number of ways and most of them are exemplified in this garden. Beans need to climb and guess what? A corn stalk makes an excellent bean pole. So instead of having to go around and stake all your beans, you just plant corn and then the beans will grow right up it. Beans are a type of plant called a legume which fixes nitrogen. And what that means is there are some plants that can take nitrogen from the atmosphere. Most plants cannot do this. They have to take it from the soil. 
Um, but legumes can take it out of the air and they store this excess nitrogen with the help of some uh, bacteria in nodules on their roots. Uh, they store it down there. And so the second year and beyond, when you have incorporated the dead bean vine back into the garden, those roots and their nodules will decay and release that excess nitrogen into the soil. So it actually adds nutrients for the other crops. Um, if you've ever grown winter squash or even summer squash, you know it has very, very big leaves and it goes everywhere. It spreads out sideways and takes over. Well, those leaves really shade the soil and this conserves moisture and it also deters a lot of weed growth. So each of those plants is helping the others. Uh, and uh, again, because they are occupying space in these different ways, they can be planted together because they're not competing for the same niche. And so different Native American um, nations and tribes found different layouts and different ways to set it up. Sometimes they would add the fourth sister, the sunflower, as part of their garden. Um, but and you can find a lot of different patterns for the different ways that they would plant the gardens. This is a northeast garden pattern. This is a southwest garden pattern. Looks quite different. Um, this looks this is actually called a waffle garden, which is what it looks like. I believe this is Zuni, but I am not sure. I'm not an expert on Native American cultures. Um, but many tribes in the southwest would do this because down there, unlike up here, you get sudden rainfall and there's a whole bunch of it at once. It doesn't come very often, so you want to keep it when it comes. So they would actually have these little pits so that when the rain did come, it could stay in there and soak in instead of running off. Whereas the mounds that you saw on the previous slide, these plants need to be fairly well drained. They can't be soggy all the time. And those mounds in a place with more regular rainfall um, allow the water to drain off, but still be available in those troughs between the mounds. Uh, and it also helped them warm up a little in our cooler northeast um, springs because these are all warm weather crops and so you wanted the soil to warm quickly. The simple version of complete nutrition is that these three crops together give you carbohydrates, protein, a wide range of vitamins and fiber plus a bunch of stuff that Nicole can tell you about. But it was also a very high total yield for your field. And what I mean by that is that if you plant one acre of corn and one acre of a three sisters garden, the one acre of corn will produce more corn than the three sisters garden, but the three sisters garden is also producing beans and squash. And when you add up the calories and the protein and the nutrition from the three sisters garden, you're getting a lot more food than you would get with simply one acre of a single crop. And again, very important to have this over the winter. The corn was almost always flower corn. This is not something that we usually grow corn for because it's a lot of work to grind it. Um, but that was their wheat. That was their grain. Most cultures the world over have some kind of grain that they use as sort of the carbohydrate base for their cooking. And here in North America, it was corn. Um, and the beans were dried. Again, you know how long dried beans keep. And the squash, of course, would keep for months and months. And again, because these crops were not related, if you had one pest attacking them, it wasn't going to attack the other two plants. So the squash vine borer only attacks squash, not beans or corn. The Mexican bean beetle only attacks the beans and the corn earworm only attacks the corn. So you didn't really want an infestation of one of these pests, but if you had it, you still had two other crops to see you through. And the same goes for diseases because they're not related plants. The most interesting thing about this garden, the thing that I love about it most was the way it fitted into the larger environment. Um, you may not be familiar with forest succession. That basically means that a place that um, is naturally a forest if you clear it, if you have some kind of disturbance, it will eventually go through stages and then end up back at mature forest over time. Now, Native Americans in the Northeast were surrounded by forest. And so they would clear 
an area for the three sisters garden and this was a village garden this was not everybody had their own little kitchen garden this was for the whole community they would girdle trees and they would burn it now a mature forest is has very very rich soil and also burned plant material is a very rich garden additive so once they had done that they had this incredibly rich field to start with and they could plant straight into that uh, and you may hear oh they always planted fish you know or didn't plant fish they put fish at the base of their mounds when they planted the corn they actually didn't need to do that very much if the soil was very depleted they might add some fish because that is a fertilizer but most of the time they didn't need to do that and the three sisters garden would grow in that cleared area for approximately 10 years which is a long time to grow the same crop in the same place usually if you grow one crop in the same place it gets depleted very quickly and you have to move it they could stretch it out for about 10 years by incorporating the old material the corn stalks and the bean vines and the squash vines that they didn't eat back into the soil and also because it was very rich to start with but then they would have to move and clear a new space for the three sisters garden remember they lived in settlements these were not nomads um, and this would be close to their settlement as well now anyone who's ever seen a vacant lot knows the first thing that happens is all the low weeds move in and then you're going to get some wildflowers um, that was going to attract in the old three sisters garden field a bunch of beneficial insects pollinators insect predators the birds would come in they would also help do control pests uh, and you're going to start to get a few small wildlife creatures moving in things you might actually want to eat like rabbits uh, over time that same open field is going to turn into shrubland you're going to get black raspberries you're going to get hazelnut bushes you're going to get various other plants that you can actually use there were an enormous number of wild edible and medicinal plants that grow in the northeast and the native americans knew how to use all of them and they would appear in these different stages because these different plants were adapted to different stages of forest succession um, and then the shrubland when you get the berries and the nuts and more woody plants you're also getting game animals and remember this is in a field very close to your settlement so you're getting the wild turkeys and the quail coming to you and the deer are going to start to venture in towards where you are so you don't have to go that far to get these game animals and eventually that old field would turn into mature forest and they kept this mature forest fairly clear by doing controlled burns which i think we're all aware of the benefits of that um, these days so this was a very highly managed landscape and the three sisters garden was just one stage of that managed landscape when europeans came over here they thought this was the most incredibly rich landscape ever and they were right but it was a managed landscape and that's why it was so rich now we don't all have a uh, several thousand acres of mature forest to play with so we're probably not going to be girdling our trees and burning for the field so we can still grow three sisters gardens just for the experience but before you do that yourself, you have to decide who's planting it. And remember, this was a village garden. This was a communal garden. Um, home, homeowners can do this. Individuals or your family, you can do this yourself. It's not terribly difficult, although it does require space. But it is also a really, really great garden to grow with a group because that's how it was intended. So schools can plant a three sisters garden, community gardens, scouting groups special ed groups it's a wonderful project to do with a group but you have to decide where you're going to put it because it's a big garden um, these are not small plants so you're going to need a space probably at least 20 feet by 20 feet and it should be in full sun i have squeezed it into a slightly smaller space but that makes it very difficult to manage um, you need a large block this was never planted in a line because corn is wind pollinated and so you need to have it in a block or you won't get a lot of corn because if the wind blows the wrong way the pollen just won't get spread so you need full sun an area about 20 by 20 feet or larger and because you are not burning and then planting into a mature forest site you're going to need a lot of soil enrichment you'll have to put in a lot of compost 
possibly some fertilizer. You can cover crop the previous year. That's another subject for another lecture. So if you know what that is, great. And if you don't, don't worry about it. Again, big garden. These are not small plants. So make sure you're not planting it in a little corner of your lawn because it's going to move out and it's going to take over. And you can find designs for how to plant this garden all over the web if you look. Um, there are some great resources on the Cornell's garden-based learning website. There's a whole publication on there called um, The Three Sisters Exploring an Iroquois Garden. Um, and you're gonna wanna plant in discrete mound and each mound is gonna have a certain number of corn seeds. You give that corn a head start so that the beans don't overwhelm it right away. The corn is gonna have to grow for about two weeks. So it gets six inches high at least. And then you plant the beans and you plant the squash. And if you notice from this diagram, there are nine mounds here. The circles are corn, the squares are beans, the triangles are squash. Only one of those mounds has squash because this is for winter squash, which spreads all over the place. And the people who came up with this layout knew that that squash needed space to ramble. And you can find different layouts. Some, uh, some cultures included more squash. They may have been shorter vine varieties, or they may just have put a bunch of them in knowing some of them would be shaded and they needed more to fill in. This one adds sunflowers and it shows you a close-up of one of the mounds, exactly how far apart you plant the corn and where you plant the beans. And the mounds look like that on the bottom. And as you can see, the water is collecting around the mound. So if those plants reach for it, they can get the water, but it's still well-drained enough to not drown them. And that's going to look, you know, a little tiny and lonely when you first put it in. Um, and then it's going to get, as in the middle picture, you're going to go, oh, this is manageable. This looks like it's green and thriving. And then it's going to get really, really large. So just don't forget that because that can cause a big problem having your garden crawl out of its space. Now, you can plant it with any kind of corn or squash or beans if you're doing sweet corn and summer squash and green beans, don't try to do that with a school group or a group that's not around for the whole year because you have to be on top of corn and beans and squash in order to pick them when they're ready. And that's midsummer. Uh, I really do prefer doing it the Native American way with the dried corn and beans and squash because it's so much easier. You just kind of wait until everything dies down and then you can pick it all and sort through it at your leisure. You don't have to go out and say, oh, the corn is ready right now. I have to get it this second. Um, and uh, also, if you're a school group, you need to know that you can leave that crop alone for the summer. So whenever I planted this with schools, we would plant it in the spring. And then when the kids came back the next year, we would be able to harvest dry beans and dried corn and winter squash. And they wouldn't have had to be there tending the crop in the middle of the summer. That would be me, just weeding here and there. Um, but anyway, once you've grown it, you might want to eat it. And Nicole can tell you a little more about that. Okay, you might have to tell me how I stop my screen sharing. I forget how it how it looks on GoToMeeting. Okay, and stop sharing screen. There we go. Yay! I figured it out. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> I didn't know about the fourth sister, to be honest, the sunflower, until I was doing some of this research and I was reading about them eating the sunflower seeds. So I thought that was really nice. All right, thanks, Okaria. You're welcome. And sorry for the delay. My microphone just decides to not work. So you guys think I'm not here and I'm like, yes, wait, I can take off the screen for you. <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you so much, Beth. I always learn so much. Um, when I when I listen to her first, so I'm sitting and I'm thinking about what I'm going to say, but I'm trying to absorb, and it's not quite sharing my PowerPoint yet. It's got a little spinning spinning circle of hopefully not doom. But my name is Nicole. I'm a uh, community nutrition educator. Here it is. Um, here at Cornell Crawford Extension of Nassau County, and let's see, no, I do not want to. Okay. So, as Beth mentioned, um, we already know that the Three Sisters have been an important part of the agricultural traditions of many different Native American populations for at least a thousand years. And 
historians see over 12 varieties of what they considered maize, what we call corn, and um, same with beans. And they also grew many types of curcubita, which includes the pumpkin, the winter squash, the melon, and the cucumber family. And again, as Beth touched on, we do have six major classes of nutrients that we use to determine overall nutritive values of food. So that's our carbohydrates, our fats, our proteins, our vitamins, minerals, and water. So the main sources of energy um, and the nutrients that we need in larger amounts are called macronutrients. And that's our carbohydrates, our proteins, and our fat. Some you hear the, about the macro diet, right? It's pretty much just keeping track of those three types of macronutrients. And then we have our micronutrients. So we need those in smaller amounts. So things like vitamins and minerals um, that help to assist our bodies metabolizing those carbs and fats and proteins. So you can see the breakdown in this little chart here um, as far as energy, protein, and water contents of the maize, beans, and pumpkin. And you can see how nutrient dense, uh, you know, say the maize, the beans, and the pumpkin seeds are, say compared to something like pumpkin flesh. Um, and then the, the protein. So you'll see that the beans and pumpkin seeds are the most dense um, sources of that protein. And then of course, you know, your beans and your maize are gonna have, you know, the highest um, concentration of water. So I thought that was interesting just to take a look at. So the food values um, of the maize and the beans depend on when they're harvested, right? So both can be consumed when they're immature. So think sweet corn, like Beth mentioned, or green beans. But the, the nutritional value, specifically the overall energy and the protein, is modest you know, in that immature product compared to a fully mature crop. So when maize and beans are picked green, most of it is water, like we saw in that, um, in that first, first uh, chart. And when fully mature, their water content plummets, and that's where you sort of get that increase in the nutritional value. So a mature maize kernel um, contains more than 40 times the energy um, and three times the protein as that sweet corn, which is really cool to think about. That uh, you know, as that plant matures, you know, there's a reason. Of course, convenience. It stores a little bit longer, but maybe they didn't know it at the time. But it's also more nutrient dense in its mature form. Same thing with green beans. So they don't have very much protein um, or energy when they are immature, but when they're mature dry beans, they're you know like protein and energy you know powerhouses, and we even know that now have you know consuming dried beans in your diet with more than a hundred times the energy and eight times the protein as that green bean. The storage time is also different in a mature bean, right, or a corn kernel than immature, which is why you know Beth was saying that for the most part, you know I don't think they grew sweet corn. What we know is sweet corn. They grew corn with the intention of you know having it dried and then making it into flour or you know something like that so again this is another a similar chart but it shows you the comparison of that sweet corn versus the grain that they you know create from that mature um, corn and you'll see that the water content you know completely drops off and then the energy i mean just explodes and same thing with the beans so that's not to say you know that we don't consume you know, green beans or sweet corn, it's not delicious, but we're not necessarily relying on these for, you know, a majority of our um, nutrition. All right, so, of course, you know, the, there's a spiritual and cultural um, aspect of the Three Sisters, just as Beth sort of outlined in the beginning. But the squash, the corn, and the beans also formed a backbone of these traditional diets and provided what we refer to as a complete vegetarian protein. So the amounts and proportions of essential amino acids will determine the protein quality. Um, so cereal grains, so something like corn, wheat, oat, um, and legumes are often referred to as incomplete because they don't have all nine essential amino acids. Um, so soy, quinoa, and buckwheat actually do have all nine, but most plant foods are lacking in you know, one or, or another. Typically, it's either um, one called lysine or methionine. This is why most subsistence farmers, which you know, we can sort of throw the Native Americans in with that as well because they're you know, using their um, crops to sustain them, um, they rely on a cereal grain. So again, a wheat, a, a rice, a maize, combined with a legume, so a bean, a lentil, a pea, to provide a majority of that you know, nutritional need that they have um, throughout the year. So 
the maize, like Beth mentioned, you know, produces large amounts of energy, modest amounts of protein, and the beans typically yield less, you know, overall, but they have, you know, much more protein. So that's important to think about. And the maize lacks lysine and tryptophan. We think of that as sort of like the turkey, you know, the turkey, you know, sleepy amino acid or the protein that we have around Thanksgiving. Um, but it has enough methionine. The bean doesn't have a lot of methionine, but it has higher levels of lysine. So by mixing the two, um, the protein quality is, in, you know, overall in that diet is increased. And according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, they determined that a ratio of 70% maize to 30% bean would provide the appropriate mix of amino acids for a complete protein in that diet. So you know, I guess some, they'll, they'll not analyze anything, but it's interesting to find out that they knew exactly the ratio. And there is still a myth today that vegetarians and vegans don't get enough protein. That's not to say that Native Americans were vegetarian or vegan, right? Based off of you know, what Beth was explaining to us, that they did have game coming in, but you know, even today we sort of everybody thinks that vegetarians don't get enough, don't get enough protein. But we know now that we don't need all of those nine amino acids in the same food or even in the same meal. And so making sure that we're having a variety of protein-rich plant foods throughout the course of your day will provide you with enough protein. So that's why even you know perhaps in times, you know, maybe in the middle of winter when they didn't have a lot of uh, game coming through, they were able to sustain themselves and get enough of that protein. So maize, again, I'm, I can start calling it corn if that's uh, more helpful, and that's sort of what we recognize it as. Um, the raw maize is largely inedible, right, especially the kind that, that they were growing, um, and they have to be kept, cooked first before they're consumed, and typically they would process it as a flour. Um, but many of the indigenous populations in North America prepared maize using what's called nixtamalization. I may be butchering that um, phrase. So that's where they, they soak the maize or they cook it in an alkaline um, solution, which changes the, the physical and chemical characteristics of that product. And the calcium contact, content of that nixtamalized corn has two to four times more calcium than the uncooked or the untreated. Um, and more essential amino acids that are available to us. It also increases the niacin in maize, which is one of our B vitamins, and increases that tryptophan, like I mentioned, um, which allows niacin to be formed. And pellagra, which is the, you know, what happens when you have niacin deficiency, was historically widespread in places like Europe. But we're not seeing that, you know, historically in indigenous populations um, before colonization, of course, right? Everything sort of changed. Um, but historians believe that the reason for that is that they consumed maize in, when at, with this process. So they were able to, you know, pull out that niacin and use it in the body a little bit better so they didn't, weren't deficient, which is so smart. They didn't know that it was happening, but it was great. <laughs> um, so as far as what we get from the corn that we recognize today, um, things like fiber, vitamin C, um, folate, some of our um, minerals like magnesium, potassium, and also um, some phytonutrients, lutein and zeaxanthin. So we see that in research being um, uh, reducing the risk of things like cataracts or macular degeneration, which is important for aging populations. It is a starchy vegetable, just to keep that in mind. So if you know somebody is diabetic or pre-diabetic, just keep that in mind. So that's something we sort of consider like a potato or um, like a whole grain on your plate. As far as squash, uh, we know that many different um, different squash and pumpkins were, were grown, but the winter, squash, the winter squash pumpkin, sort of, I might use that interchangeably, um, is the most nutrient dense, so I sort of focused on that one. And so they made a significant contribution to, you know, the Native Americans diet, um, the flesh, so the actual or you know, orange part, contains you know, a modest amount of calories, a little bit of protein, even though that's incomplete, which I'll follow up with in a little bit, um, large amounts of vitamin A, so that's that bright, beautiful color, and the seeds also, as we saw before, very um, nutrient and protein dense. So similar to the maize and beans, again, that flesh is not a complete protein, but the amino acids complement those in the maize and the beans. So it becomes you know, sort of that very high quality protein we're looking for. Also a good source of fiber. So there are certain polysaccharides that um, are indigestible, indigestible type of fiber that can help to prevent our blood sugar from spiking 
um, and also sort of you know keeps our gut happy, things moving along. Um, and in addition to things like potassium and also the, that lutein and zeaxanthin again. And like Beth mentioned, these things can be stored right throughout the winter, so they're you know desirable and they they're important for the the months that maybe we, they can't have that abundant garden that Beth mentioned. Um, as far as current, you know, present day, how long I keep my squash, it does, it can keep for a few months, um, depending on the environment that you keep it in, depending on the variety. But I would say, you know, within a month is probably, you know, ideal. But that doesn't mean that if you have, you know, butternut squash hanging out for two or three months that it's not edible. So just keep that in mind. They also, I don't know if, I've never done this and I don't know if it's a practice used today, but the Native Americans used to slice and dry their squash and they could keep it even longer. This is what I read in a study. I've never done it myself, but we'll see. Maybe one day I'll try that. So as far as beans, um, they're incredibly versatile, you know, affordability we weren't necessarily worried about a thousand years ago um, and very easy to use. And so present day, of course, we can get them frozen, canned, of course, dried, um, and it's, they're relatively simple to prepare. They're in a group that we call now pulses. I don't know if that's a relatively new term or just new to sort of the nutrition world, um, but that includes the lentils, dried beans, um, dried peas group. So I might say pulses instead of beans, but they're some of the mo most nutrient dense plant foods. So a half a cup of cooked beans, which is not difficult to do, right? Not difficult to get. You get at least 20% of your fiber, which is a nutrient of concern for most Americans, um, and folate, man manganese, and then at least 10%. Um, so this is just the, the daily value. This is an, you know, an, an average person. Um, protein, potassium, iron, manganese, copper, and then 6% of things like selenium and zinc. So things that we don't even really think about. Um, in addition to a lot of phytochemicals, so different alkaloids, flavonoids, um, tannins, Whole bunch of good stuff. So we think of beans as having fiber and protein, but they really have a lot more, you know, things to offer. So and compared to other plant foods that we may think of, they have twice the protein of something like quinoa, which again, as a plant food, we think of as being high quality protein, and four times the fiber of brown rice. So just remember that fiber is very important for your gut health and also heart health. And we do have a lot of research on beans. So it's linked with um, several health benefits, including lower, you know, lower blood blood cholesterol, uh, lower body weight, right, maintenance overall, um, higher intakes of dietary fiber. We see um, related to uh, reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, some types of cancer. So, very, it's a great thing to include in your diet if you don't already. They could be added to chili um, casseroles, other dishes, substituted for meat in something like a chili. Um, so I find myself typically, you know, squash and beans, especially this time of year, putting them in tacos because they're just, they're very hearty. I'm a vegetarian, if you didn't know. Um, so they're very hearty and it sort of bulks up that taco and it's, it's, it's incredibly satisfying. And you could put the corn right on top of it. So you see the three sisters used a lot in a stew or a soup, but since I did a soup with the squash class, I decided to keep this very simple and sort of just, it's more of a visual and an idea uh, for an easy weeknight meal, you know, something that you can, you know, maybe if you're making squash, you're making dried beans, you're making um, some sort of grain or something like that, you can make a little bit extra and then you have like a fantastic packed lunch that everybody's gonna be jealous of. Um, so today for this harvest bowl, I have some, a little bit of quinoa, I threw in an extra, an extra thing just because I had it. Um, so a little bit of beans of choice. So I have pinto beans, some squash. So last time I used butternut, so I used acorn squash today that I roasted. So it was already cooked. Like I said, that this is something that you can cook, you know, ahead of time and then sort of slap this together. I, I kept my corn fresh. I didn't, I wanted a little bit of crunch. I wanted something to contrast the roasted squash. So I kept my corn, I just cut it right off the cob. I had some dill, so that's what I added with my corn, but you could use parsley, um, you know, uh, cilantro, and this uh, tahini maple dressing. So I'm going to, I'll share the recipe with you before I change the view and you can see what I'm making. So 
tahini if, if you've never heard of tahini it's ground sesame so it's sort of like a, you know comparable to a nut butter but using sesame seeds <clears throat> although i do, i have heard that sesame allergies are on the rise if you have a nut allergy you, you can use tahini but again this is an individual choice and if you're sensitive or if you are concerned you can skip that and use something like sunflower seed butter a little bit of olive oil some fresh lemon um, a little bit of maple syrup for sweetness some garlic and some water to thin. So I'll show you as I'm making it. Sometimes when you add water, the tahini like seizes up, but you just keep mixing and we're good to go. So I'm gonna stop sharing and adjust my screen. I feel like I have this, uh, the same thing as you, Beth. I always have to figure out what I'm doing. <laughs> I also like something like this because you can eat it um, room temperature, hot, you know, cold. It can come right from the fridge. You don't have to worry about, you know, heating it up. So I already have my quinoa. So again, if you just cooked a little bit extra quinoa or rice or farro, bulgur, whatever you got, just sort of bulks it up. You can also treat it as a salad and you can completely cut out that grain. So I have some quinoa. So this has to, you know, I have to share this with my husband. So I'll just make one bowl at a time. So I have some acorn squash. All I did was um, olive oil, salt and pepper. Sometimes I'll put a little bit of maple syrup, but since I'm putting maple syrup in the dressing, I sort of left it um, as is. I have some pinto beans. Again, you can use, you know, cannellini beans, um, chickpeas, whatever you'd like. I have, so I already mixed the dill with my corn, but again, you could use any type of herb that you like. And you can also, you know, roast your corn. You don't have to use it raw like I did. So, the bowl is ready, but now I'm going to make the dressing. And I chose this because sometimes when I use my food press processor, you know, it's a, I have to sort of bust everything out. But I kept it simple today, and it's a, a dressing that you can easily make without any sort of gadget. So we have about a third of a cup of the tahini. Again, if you've never had it, it's very reminiscent of a nut butter. It has a very nutty flavor. It can go with almost any kind of cuisine. You know, it's used a lot in say, you know, Mediterranean or Middle Eastern cuisine. Um, it's used as an ingredient in hummus, but it really, it's it's somewhat neutral. Like it's, it's something that can go with a lot of different flavors. And that's part of the reason why I like it so much. Okay. And also I don't have a ton of little gadgets in my kitchen because my kitchen would be overflowing, but two things that have been sort of adult purchases, I'll call them, because you don't really care about it when you're younger. Uh, a lemon, you know, lemon or citrus juicer. So you don't have to worry about getting every last drop because you just put it in here. And this is probably not news to anyone, but it was exciting for me. So it, it juices the lemon so easily. And I don't have to worry about seeds. I don't have to worry about sort of you know, losing out on the lemon juice. So I'm gonna do almost the full lemon, but I'll I'll sort of wait that wait for the last squeeze just in case, you know, I, I want to adjust it later. So you want about three tablespoons. And again, this might depend on your taste. So we'll start with that. The other gadget is a, a garlic press. <laughs> My Italian grandmother would probably not be fond of this, but it makes everything easier. So that's all you gotta do. About one clove of garlic, again, you can adjust that depending on what your preference is. I usually start with about a tablespoon of maple syrup. Again, taste preference. This is crown maple. I'm just doing a, I'm not paid by them, but it's my favorite. It's my favorite syrup in the whole world. They're, they're located in upstate New York. Just a tiny bit of olive oil. We're getting those healthy fats from the tahini. So this is really, you know, it's just sort of smooth everything out. It's just like a little hint of that flavor. It goes really nice with tahini, of course, and garlic. And then a little salt and pepper. So I'll start mixing it just so you can see what I mean, that it's sort of, it seizes up a little bit and then as you add the water you know if you, you, it'll 
smooth everything out. You may not need a lot of water, but you want it to be a pourable dressing. So maybe, you know, a tablespoon at a time. And then all of a sudden it just comes together. You think it looks kind of yucky, <laughs> and then it comes together. And it smells really good, it smells nutty. And at this point you can taste it. You may like a little bit more garlic, maybe you want a little more acid, so you want that, a little more lemon juice, maybe you want more maple syrup, that's up to you. So it's a little thick, so I'm gonna add a little bit more water just so I can pour it over my whole bowl. And this will keep for a few days. I mean, you know, if you're making a big batch, this might just be enough for, you know, your family. If you made, you know, enough for a few bowls, since it's just me and my husband, this this will probably last us a few days. I might put this on a falafel. I might put it on maybe not a taco. I mean, it might not be terrible on a taco, especially if you had a little bit of cilantro. But got to make it perfect, right? That perfect consistency. So one thing I might add, something like this would be like a Brussels sprout. I know this is a three sisters garden, <laughs> but I, this time of year, all I think about are Brussels sprouts. So that's the only thing that I feel like is missing from this, personally. Um, but it's delicious. I mean, you could mix it all completely or you can sort of just eat it as is, but it's really, it's something that's fresh. It's something that's light. Um, so sometimes when you're dealing with sort of fall or winter winter vegetables it's heavy it can be very heavy but this is something that's very light the herbs lighten it up you know the quinoa of course you could put chicken on this you don't have to keep it vegetarian i know i sort of focus on a lot of vegetarian options but you can absolutely put a piece of fish piece of chicken and um you, you can also use different beans different squash different herbs so you can make it completely your own but now i now i have dinner so any questions It looks so nice. Do you um, need to refrigerate the dressing or will it harden I would up? It. I would refrigerate it. Most of the time, so you actually do typically want to refrigerate things like nut butters and even my tahini, I do refrigerate my tahini. So I would keep that in the fridge. It may thicken like you mentioned, so you might just have to add a little bit more water just to get it to that consistency that I worked so hard. Just the perfect consistency for me, but um, I would keep it in the fridge. Oh, that was perfect. And even, um, at our last, um, you know, program, you were talking about the acorn squash. I mm -hmm. mean, you could even kind of reverse that and have the acorn squash on the bottom, the quinoa, the corn and beans, and then the dressing. You're calling me out. I feel like you're calling me out because that's a much better. <laughs> no, not at all. It's just all different varieties of this great recipe, but right. it looks delicious. And the bowl looks so colorful. You could always tell it's it healthy when it's so colorful. That's why I was thinking, I was like, the only thing that I would add, and I know we're showcasing the Three Sisters, is something like a cruciferous vegetable, just because, you know, that's what I think of also with fall. So something green, of course, the herbs are green, but, a, you know, broccoli, or, you know, or roasted Brussels sprouts, I think, would just sort of satisfy. Oh, totally. Especially because of these Americans probably did not stick to, oh, we can only put right. these three things in a bowl. Right. They had a huge right. range of, like, other things that absolutely you know cultivate and collect and forage and they yeah. would have put all kinds of stuff in there thanks yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh that's great thank you so much to nicole and beth here let me end the recording here hold absolutely. on